Good morning, church. Welcome to the building. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. Thanks for floating in to worship King Jesus together. Uh, my name is Kelly, and I am delighted um, to try to help you connect here at Grace. There are several ways you can. Um, I have a few announcements. Uh, November 10th at 6 p.m., our Trimble campus is having a chili cook-off. So if you are interested in sampling or submitting an entry, um, please join them. You can sign up online or in the lobby. Also, we will celebrate as a church family at Thanksgiving dinner. It is on Wednesday, November 20th at 6 p.m. During dinner, we'll reveal our proposed 2025 budget. You can RSVP online or in the lobby. And then lastly, um, Operation Christmas Child is a ministry that Grace is really involved in here at Grace. And so over Adventure Week this past summer, the kids collected a lot of items. And so Wednesday, November 13th, we'll have a big packing party here in the gym. It's a lot of fun. Please, please come and help us. And then the week of November 18th through the 25th, um, we will be a collection site, and we literally like would love for you to come help labor. Um, and so Nick Brown is going to come up and share a little bit more about this ministry. So every year I uh, come up and I say the guys that are helping me do the heavy lifting, moving the big cartons, usually are all older than me. And I keep on putting a little thing out there saying, somebody please volunteer that's younger than me. Um, and I keep on getting older. I'm not getting any younger. Uh, so uh, 18th through the 25th, 24th and 25th will be the days that we're moving the heavier boxes. We'll have a couple, maybe as many as three semis out there loading them. Um, our hope is to have roughly 7,500 to 10,000 shoe boxes loaded out of here to go to kids throughout the world. Um, the thing I want to say, and I don't know how to get through to you, um, without choking up and crying. But the thing I want to say is, you have an opportunity here to impact somebody's life for eternity. And uh, I don't know how to get that to people. Uh, sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't. But 18th through the 25th of November, if you want to volunteer, we'll be up here the next two Sundays taking names. If you do it, you'll be playing a part in something that's gonna change some kids' lives. I don't know which kids, but every year I hear stories from adults that were kids, and they tell stories of how their lives were changed, not just for here, but for eternity, because they walk away from those shoeboxes asking, who loves me so much that they would give me something like this? And that's a work of God, you know, because I know when I was a kid, I just figured I deserved it, you know. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you guys to look at a video that we're going to play, and then we'll go on with uh, some other stuff. Let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Operation Christmas Child is a way for the little children to come to Almighty God. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, children are being discipled, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These children are brave and bold, not afraid, and they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. Let them come, Jesus said, let them come. And they're coming. They're coming by the millions. Every single box represents the life of a young boy, a young girl who will be touched by the gospel. Jesus has come to give them light, that they do not need to be in the darkness, that they have hope, that they have joy. And it is our prayer that this glorious light of the gospel will flow among the nations and will fill our land with the knowledge of the glory of God. 
the Lord God Almighty desires to fulfill his redemptive plan for mankind in and through each of us and all of us. All of us are children of God. We share this incredible opportunity to take the gospel truly to the ends of the earth by gathering children to Jesus. I believe this year for Operation Christmas Child, this may be the most important year, most important opportunity that we'll ever have to reach children in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray that God will use these shoebox gifts to make a difference in the children's life for eternity. So I would usually say, let's pray, but I'm going to ask you to act and ask you to please sign up and help and do something. Um, it's simple. Um, it just takes a little time, and you probably won't even, you probably won't feel what, like what you're doing is profound. But that's, uh, that's the part that God does. He adds the increase. So um, with that, I've got the scripture verse for today that I'm supposed to read. Thanks. <laughs> a little disorganized. Psalm 95, 1 through 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come now, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care.
days a week now. Let's continue to give him praise this morning. Let the world see the light on a hill. Let the world see your purpose fulfilled. Let the world see your glory. Let the world see your love in our heart. Lord, you so love the like this time change thing? No? Some people do. I noticed that there's more of you awake this morning, though. <laughs> and the room filled up a lot faster than it usually does. But... darkness hope that's in the blood there's future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ is one so I can face tomorrow for tomorrow's in your hand all I need you will provide just like you always have I'm fighting the battle You already won No matter what comes my way I will overcome I don't know what you're doing But I know what you've done 
Savior, my defense. No more fear in life or death. Well, I know how the story ends. We will be with you again. You're my Savior. Thank you for the Lord, uh, just the love that you have shown us, the mercy and the grace that you've given us. Lord, we know that how this story ends, just like we sang. So help, help us not to be anxious during these times. Your word says that things would happen and that there would be a time where um, we would be ch challenged and tri there would be trials would come. But Lord, we know that your word is true that you'll never leave and forsake us. So help us to lean into you this morning as we open your word. Help us to see the truth of the gospel. You sent your son a perfect sacrifice on our behalf. And it's because of what he did on the cross that we're able to even stand before you this morning. Lord, it's our faith in him that saves us and nothing more, nothing that we do. Lord, help us to be good stewards of this gift of the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. As you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to invite our kindergartners and our first graders to join the Cannon family in the back for We Worship. So if you are a kindergarten and first grader, you can head on that way. Every November, they focus on the importance of giving. So I think that's a for November, Thanksgiving, it's a really good time to do that. But as they leave, I'm curious if you guys remember what you learned last November. Can you remember what George preached on a year ago today? Jesus. That was probably Jesus. <laughs> Some of you are wondering, what did he preach on last week? But um, no, uh, David, you're actually wrong. It, because, and it's, I mean, sort of. Uh, the reason is, is because it was a trick question. George didn't preach a year ago today. I did. <laughs> but Jesus was right. So that was, that was the right, yeah. Um, yeah, so it was November 5th, 2023. It was exactly one calendar year before the presidential election. I took a cue from Missouri, which now has early voting, and I did some early preaching. I, I wanted to encourage you all and us all, me included, right, to keep our cool over this past year, knowing that we would be tempted to give into fear and to anger and to, uh, to just lose our focus that, that, that our election cycles um, tend to, to make that happen sometimes. And it's been a wild and tumultuous election cycle, this particular one, right? Candidates have changed. Platforms have changed. There was an assassination attempt. Plenty has happened that so easily could have drawn our attention away from the hope that we have in Christ. That's why I checked in with you six months ago today 
when I preached about the importance of walking in wisdom. And it's also why I'm back up here today, one last time, uh, before Tuesday at least. And you might be thinking, didn't George preach on this last week? If you do remember what George preached on last week, he did kind of cover some of this stuff. So there's going to be some crossover for when I say and what George said last week. But here's the distinguishing difference I would say. Whereas George gave you a pre-election filter last week, I want to give you a post-election filter. Meaning, when we wake up on Wednesday morning, how should we as Christians behave regardless of the, the results? Because one of the most poignant moments from George's sermon last week for me was when he asked us to analyze what kingdom are we focused on? Are we focused on, are we more worried and concerned about this world, this temporary place and time? Or are we more concerned with God's eternal kingdom? It's so easy to be distracted by the here and now. But as Philippians 3.20 says, our true citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, I want to help us stay focused on the true kingdom by looking at the words of the king. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus begins his sermon on the mount. He spends three chapters talking about his kingdom and what his subjects look like. And it ends up being so opposite of what his audience assumed it would be. Like six times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus confronts their assumptions by saying, you have heard that it was said this, but I tell you something new. For example, he says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. This was a brand new way of thinking for them. But what I find amazing is that we've had these red letters of Jesus for nearly 2,000 years, and yet we often act like its meaning is still new to us. So let me encourage you this morning to focus in on these words as we read them so we aren't taking them for granted. Would you read with me Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 10? Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Would you pray with me? Lord, I, I know that this world is, can so easily distract us from living as devoted subjects of your kingdom. And I just pray that this morning we would block out those distractions and we would focus on the words of your son. Thank you for sending him to not only teach us a better way to live, but also, more importantly, to provide the only way for us to be made right with you. So Holy Spirit, teach us now to rest in the promise of your kingdom as we tarry in this one. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So the verses I just read to you are called often the Beatitudes, right? We get that from, it's a weird word, we get it from Latin. Uh, it's a Latin word meaning blessings. You'll notice that the verse, verses 3 through 11 all start with, blessed are the blank. And then each verse following ends describing their blessing. They will, they will be comforted. They will be filled. They will be shown mercy. But rather than focusing on the blessings or the beatitudes of each verse, I want to focus on the attitudes of each verse. What type of people receive these blessings? This will give us a clear picture of what a kingdom mindset looks like. So let's walk through these attitudes one by one. We're going to start with the poor in spirit. And this one may take a little bit longer to explain than most. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? The Greek word for poor refers to one who is completely destitute. They have to beg for charity. They have no other option. And we see plenty of people like this in the scriptures. Jesus interacted with a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. Paul interacted with an unnamed beggar in Acts chapter 3. There were undoubtedly beggars there listening to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. 
And the common assumption back then was that their poverty was a result of their poor spiritual condition. Either their faith was too weak or their sin was so great that God must have been punishing them. Which means, conversely, they assumed that if a person was healthy and wealthy, that must mean because of, it was because of their great faith or their greater faithfulness. But here, Jesus explains that's not how God's economy works. You assumed cursed are the poor in spirit. No, no, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, the poor in spirit recognize that they are spiritually and morally bankrupt. They know there is nothing they can do to transactionally earn a spot in God's kingdom. They know the reality of what Jesus says in, later in his sermon. If you look down in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus says this, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Our righteousness, our own righteousness can't measure up. But here's something I want you to notice from that verse. Did you notice who's in the same spot as us? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Read it again. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. We're all spiritually needy. Whether we realize it or not. So if all of our righteousness is falling short, then how do any of us gain entry into the kingdom of heaven? And the answer is through Jesus' righteousness. He lived a perfect life. He paid the penalty for the sins of those who acknowledge their spiritual poverty and put their faith in him. And if that's something you haven't done, I want to invite you right now to do what beggars do, cry out for mercy. Acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of God's grace. Believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again, and then commit to being focused on his kingdom. Guys, the first part of a kingdom mindset is understanding that we don't belong in the kingdom. We are beggars, and God has graciously given us the riches of his kingdom through his son, Jesus. So to wrap this beatitude up, a kingdom mindset begins with the humble understanding that we are spiritually needy. It's the opposite of the world's mindset of pride and self-righteousness. Now, I want to pause for a second. I want to tell you how to use your outline today. You'll notice there are no blanks in your outline. With each beatitude, I'm going to show you a kingdom mindset and a worldly mindset. And at first, I thought I would be clever And I would turn your bulletin into a ballot. And I would give you the option of electing which mindset mindset you were going to elect or select. But you know what you would have done? You would all put the check mark by the right one, and you wouldn't give it a second thought. So instead, I've given you a series of scales to evaluate yourself. As we go along today, I want you to physically mark where you feel your personal attitudes fall on these scales. And listen, I know some of you right now may be reading into things, and you might be upset with me because I put all the good stuff on the left and the bad mindset on the right. (laughs) Don't read into that. That, I'm serious. Don't. There's nothing going on there. Just evaluate yourself as to where your personal mindset is on these scales. Does it fall closer to the kingdom mindset or the worldly mindset. In this case, are you humble enough to admit your spiritual neediness, or do you have a prideful attitude that is trying to earn a spot in the kingdom? Jesus says that spot is reserved for the poor in spirit. Let me move on to the next one. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn. I know that mourning is not a mindset that we want to sign up for. But the reality is, times of mourning are coming for us all. And I'm so grateful that we have a God that comes alongside those who grieve with a loss or endure suffering, and he offers comfort to the downcast, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7. But I don't think that's the type of mourning being described in verse 4. I would agree with many theologians who believe the mourning in verse 4 is tied to the spiritual poverty of verse 3. Here's how that works out. After 
realizing how spiritually destitute they are, the poor in spirit now mourn over their inability to save themselves. They're not just spiritually bankrupt, they're spiritually broken. The same Greek word used for mourning is used elsewhere to describe how we should feel about our own sin. Paul encourages the Corinthian church to stop turning a blind eye to the immorality going on inside the church and to instead mourn it. And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of external reasons in our culture to mourn as well. If I could be honest with you for just a second, if Amendment 3 passes, I'm going to mourn. I just am. But I don't want the evil that exists in a lost world to distract me from examining and grieving my own sin that it also lies within my own heart. Does that make sense? It's easy to point to the sins of others, but it can be hard to be honest with yourself and be grieved by your own sin. But we must. Because Paul acknowledges in 2 Corinthians 7.10, he says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to what? Salvation. And leaves no regret. That's the comfort this beatitude brings. Salvation. As Paul said, there's no regret in that type of mourning. And if you fail to mourn over your sin now, you will regret it for eternity. So as you look in your bulletin in that scale for the second one, ask yourself, where do you fall? Like, is your heart convicted and grieved by your sin, or are you spiritually numb with a hardened heart? Think on that and make a mark where you think you fall. Next, we learn that the kingdom mindset includes meekness. Blessed are the meek. What does meek mean? Meek is not synonymous with weak, as some think it is. Meekness actually involves strength. Meekness is often described as strength under control. In Jesus' day, it was, the, it was the same word that they would use to describe a soft breeze or a tame horse. Like, it, it's calm right now, but at any moment, it can become fierce and wild. Jesus is the epitome of meekness. This is why C.S. Lewis chose a lion to depict Jesus in the Narnia series. When Lucy hears that this lion named Aslan is on the move, she's never met this character before, she asks Mr. Beaver, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver unashamedly says, of course he's not safe, but he's good. He's the king. Jesus described himself as meek, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. The word gentle in that verse is the same Greek word for meek that's used in Matthew chapter 5. In fact, your translation may even use the word gentle instead of meek. Jesus had no problem calling himself meek. In fact, Jesus portrayed himself this way. At his triumphal entry, he didn't come in power, riding a strong steed. He came in gentle and riding on a donkey. And this is not what the Jews of the day wanted for their Messiah. They wanted a strong king who would bring force and power, ousting the Romans for their land. And I think a lot of Christians today have that same mindset. The mindset that if we can just elect the right people, they'll use a strong, harsh hand to force things to be the way that I want them to be. But Jesus made it clear that it's not what his kingdom is about. It's about gentleness. And now look, I've read Revelation 19. I know that when Jesus is coming back, he's coming back with a very strong hand. But that's for him to enact, not us. We imitate his first coming, not his second. So as we consider this scale, ask yourself, how are you at keeping your strength under control? Are you more gentle or harsh? Where do you fall? Next, we learn that the kingdom mindset includes a hunger and a thirst 
for righteousness. Much like I think the first two are tied together, I think the second two are tied together. Because if you feel the need to exert your strength and be harsh in a non-gentle manner, then it gives evidence that you may have a hunger or a desire for something that is not righteous, and you're trying to make it happen. Scripture gives us a good overview of what these desires might be. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17, through 17, we'll put it up on the screen. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, and then he gives us a list. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. If I could summarize those desires, I would say like the lust of the flesh is a desire for pleasure. The lust of the eyes is a desire maybe for possessions. And that lust, that pride of life is a desire for praise or maybe power. And we see in scripture how these desires never bring fulfillment. Adam and Eve wanted to know the pleasure of the forbidden fruit. It ended poorly. Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament when they sold some of their possessions, they wanted to keep back a portion of their profits. That ended poorly for them. Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, he sought praise through worship of his golden statue. That ended poorly. These people failed to recognize what John explained in verse 17. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So we should hunger and thirst for the will of God. It alone will bring true satisfaction. So as you consider this scale, evaluate your appetite. Is your appetite for the righteous things of God or for the empty things of this world? Like fleeting pleasure, material possessions, the temporary praise of men. If you feel empty, maybe it's because your desires are for the things of this world. Next, we learn that a kingdom mindset is one of mercy. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. And this is quite opposite of the Roman mindset. Romans called mercy the disease of the soul. Did you hear that? Mercy was described by the Romans as the disease of the soul. To them, it was evidence that you didn't have the strength to be a real Roman. But I would argue that showing mercy takes way more strength than vengeance. It's easy to hurt those who hurt you. But consider for a moment the restraint Jesus displayed when being crucified. Do you all realize that with a word, he could have decimated those who were crucifying him, accusing him, mocking him, berating him. But instead, he chose these words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Church, when you display mercy and compassion for your enemy, you are not displaying a disease or a weakness. You are displaying the heart of Christ in his kingdom. Go to the scale and ask yourself, which mindset are you displaying? Is it Christ's compassion or is it a worldly vengeance? Which is more of your mindset on a day-to-day? I know I'm going through these quickly, but that's because we don't have a lot of time. Next, a kingdom mindset also involves purity in heart. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. Here, Jesus is addressing more than just our outward behavior. He's tackling our inward motivation as well. He's calling us to have pure hearts. That means he's calling us to be clean on the inside. Jesus uh, refers to this later when he criticizes the Pharisees for only obeying the, out, the law outwardly and not having a proper motivation. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 through 26, Jesus criticizes them. He says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Just so you know, Jesus isn't talking about dishes here. He's pointing out that the Pharisees appear to be holy on the outside, but it's all a show. Inwardly, they're greedy and selfish. Jesus doesn't just want our outward actions. He wants our heart. 
As George preached a couple weeks ago, you can obey the law but not fulfill it. To fulfill the law means choosing love. It reminds me what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.5. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Heart, conscience, faith. Those are all expressions of what's truly going on inside of us. Like you might be able to fool others around you that you're sincere, but God knows. And he wants the whole you. And where you place your mark on this particular scale may determine how much of you he has. Are you operating from a place of sincere faith or are you operating from hypocrisy? Make your mark. Another part of the kingdom mindset is being a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. Guys, I don't know if you've noticed, but lately in our country, people have not been getting along. And it's gotten so bad that my wife has made an official statement. And by official statement, I mean one day she said something and then I posted it on social media. Um, (laughs) We were watching some talking head show where people were yelling at each other because that's what passes for news today. And she just got fed up and she said, everyone is so divisive about everything, it's exhausting. Can she get an amen? Anyone else feel exhausted by the divisiveness in this culture? I bet we all do, but here's the question I have. Are you doing your best to make peace or are you adding fuel to the fire? You don't see a lot of peacemakers in our country right now. No one is willing to offer the slightest olive branch to a person on the other side. Like we have somehow concluded that a step towards peace is a step towards compromise, which is not necessarily the case. Jesus was a peacemaker. If you are a Christian, he made peace between you and God. Colossians 1 says that you were once alienated as God's enemies because of your sin, but you are now reconciled to God thanks to Jesus making peace on the cross through his blood. But he isn't just a peacemaker between us and God. He's also a peacemaker between us and others. In Jesus' day, there was perhaps no greater hostility that existed than between Jew and Gentile. And Paul notes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, that Jesus destroyed the dividing wall of hostility between them and made peace through the cross, uniting them as family, no longer enemies. So church, when you become a peacemaker. You are imitating Christ. That's why this beatitude says that a peacemakers will be called children of God because they take after their father. Paul makes it clear in, in 2 Corinthians 5 that our job as believers is to present Christ's message of reconciliation, of peacemaking to the world. So let me give you two scriptures on how to do that. In Ephesians 4, 3, he says, make every effort. Let me say that again. Make every effort. This takes work. To keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There, Paul is talking about keeping the peace between fellow believers, which George has been preaching on recently. In the verse prior to this, Paul says this is going to take humility. This is going to take gentleness. This is going to take patience on your part. And this is with people that you like. But we do this because we are called to bear with one another in love. But church family, we are also called to make peace where we can with anyone. As it says in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So as you look to that scale, how would you describe yourself today? as more of a peacemaker or a troublemaker. I beg you, don't be looking for trouble. Imitate your Savior and look for ways to make peace. Here's the final mindset, the final beatitude. It involves a willingness to be persecuted. This is another one that I don't think many of us are wanting to sign up for. 
But scripture tells us that this is not just a kingdom mindset, folks. This is a kingdom reality. Paul tells Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's the nature of being a Christ follower. Paul experienced it. All of the apostles experienced it. Christ experienced it first. That's why he warned his disciples in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Guys, don't forget his first crown was a crown of thorns. We should expect persecution. But here's the thing. Paul likens persecution to a badge of honor. He tells us in Romans 8, 17, that we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Do you wear that as a badge of honor? If we're not experiencing some sort of hostility from the world because of our faith, we need to ask ourselves if we are living in a a way that honestly points to Jesus or if we are merely blending in. To paraphrase one commentator, Righteous living is by its nature confrontational to wickedness. John in his gospel puts it like this. He likened it to turning on a light switch in a dark room. Like if you love the darkness and hate the light, then you want to hurt the person that flips on the switch, right? That's what righteous living does to those who live in darkness. It drives them to anger and hate, and it can manifest in several ways. If you keep reading Jesus' words in verse 11, he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Because of me. That last part is so key. Don't miss that. Remember what the Beatitude says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Church, sometimes the derision we receive has nothing to do with Jesus' righteousness and everything to do with our own unrighteousness. Look at me. Don't you cry persecution if the heat that you are experiencing has nothing to do with Christ. If you're a jerk, own up to being a jerk. Don't hide behind your faith. You hear me? So when it comes to this scale, I need to ask you two questions. Are you experiencing or bearing any hostility or are you just blending in? And if you do see hostility, is it because of righteousness or is it because of your own sin? Really investigate that. Make sure any persecution you experience is because of righteousness. Then you can respond in what seems like a peculiar way. Jesus ends this section with these words in verse 12. He says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. He tells us to rejoice and be glad over our persecution. That seems odd. But I, tell, but I told you at the beginning, Jesus was giving his followers a new way of thinking. And that didn't start here in verse 12. It started the first time he said, blessed. Blessed in the Greek language means happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are the meek. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Happy are the merciful. Happy are the pure in heart. Happy are the peacemakers. And yes, happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The blessings that come with these mindsets far outweigh any consequences that could come from an election or the benefits that this world has to offer. Come Wednesday, I hope you realize that and put these mindsets into practice. I promise you, you will be better off for it. But here's the thing. This is not all about what benefits you. God wants to use us to expand the kingdom. And after giving us this kingdom mindset, Jesus transitions to laying out the kingdom mission. In verses 13 through 16, he calls us to be salt 
and light in the world. For the sake of time, I'm going to be brief. But let me cover these two. There's a debate about what Jesus meant by calling us the salt of the earth in verse 13. They used salt differently back then. For instance, since they didn't have refrigerators, salt was how they preserved their food. So a very common, very popular interpretation is that Jesus is calling us to use our influence as believers to do what we can to slow the moral decay in our culture. And I'm completely good with that interpretation. But let me tell you something. It involves much more than just voting our biblical values. As George said last week, the Bible was written to people who didn't have the luxury of a vote. So how did they put this into practice? And I think the second analogy is helpful. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If we are truly living with a kingdom mindset, then we won't be able to help but shine. And yes, some people are going to hate you for that. But others are going to be drawn to that light, and they're going to know its source. And that's when we point to the king. We show them how to abandon the futility of this world and instead focus on the glory of King Jesus and the kingdom. Church, my prayer over this past year is that the people of Grace Community Church would not lose focus. That we wouldn't take the bait and get sidetracked from our kingdom mission. And as a whole, it appears to me that you've done a good job of that. Only you and the Lord and maybe your closest family members know. But I hope you look back at those scales in your bulletin and you realize where you need to ask God to sharpen your focus. Pray for that. Seek counsel in God's word for that. Seek counsel from other believers for that. But I also want to call you in these final days leading up to Tuesday to stay vigilant, stay humble, stay gentle. And guys, be confident in Jesus because in him all things hold together. And you guys are going to need to hold it together way longer than through Tuesday because regardless of how things shakes out, this world is going to need peacemakers. Be one of them. Be a part of reconciling people to the kingdom. Would you pray with me? King Jesus, give us a mindset to help us to navigate this world that is so easily distracting us. God, just focus on, let us focus on how to honor you. Holy Spirit, make us aware of our sin so that we may mourn and repent. God, may we first recognize that without your grace, we are spiritually bankrupt. We're without hope. Father, lead us to be gentle, keeping our strength under control as your son did. Give us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And may our worldly desires for pleasure, possessions, and power fade away. May we look on our fellow image bearers with mercy and compassion as you do with us. God, test our motivations. Lord, may our actions be spurred from a pure heart that pleases you. Help us to imitate your son and be peacemakers by drawing people to the cross of Christ. And Lord, when persecution does come, may it be for the right reason. Your righteousness. Allow us to rejoice in that persecution, knowing that we'll eventually share in your glory. And may this mindset drive us to be on mission, shining your light so others can see. God, may it ever be in our minds that our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait a savior from there, our Lord and King Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. We're gonna, we're gonna close this morning by singing a song that draws focus to both our king and our mission. I'll be down front if you want to talk. The altar is open for prayer. Well, let's give him true focus this morning as we stand and sing.
Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. Church, thank you for humoring me over the past year. Three sermons over the course of a year has been fun. Uh, I, I want to leave you with more wisdom from the Sermon on the Mount. Under the heading, Do Not Worry, which I think is very appropriate for our day and age, um, Jesus gives us this encouragement. He says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. God bless you, church. You go be salt and light. You're dismissed. Mm-hmm.